When we're classifying our study site, if we look at the vegetation and we determine that it seems to represent a mid-successional or late-successional vegetation, then we can use it as well to help with our classification. If it's early successional vegetation, then it's going to be more representative of whatever the recent disturbance happened, rather than uh, representative of the soil characteristics, which is what we're interested in getting at. There are two approaches to the vegetation analysis, and the first that we'll do is using indicator plant analysis to estimate the soil moisture and soil nutrient regimes. In the field, we did a vegetation survey where we identified all of the plant species in an area of our plot, and we also estimated the percent cover of each of those species. So that's what's in this table here. Then perhaps in the field or perhaps later, we got our field guide out and looked up what the indicator species group value was for these different plants that we found. Notice that the first three are tree species, and it's a little tricky to decide whether to include them in this or not. If it's natural regeneration, they're seedly instead of seeded and naturally, they may be indicative of soil conditions. But if we're looking at mature trees, and it's likely that those trees were planted, they may be more indicative of the management rather than the site conditions themselves. So in this case, we're just going to skip the tree species and not consider them. For the rest of the species, we'll look them up in the appendix in our field guide. So for Rubus spectabilis, or salmonberry, for example, we see that as a moisture indicator, it's a member of indicator species group 5, and as a nutrient indicator, it's a member of indicator species group 3. So in each case, we write down the indicator species group 5 for moisture, 3 for nutrients, and then for percent cover, we just copy over the percent cover that we measured, in this case 25. We do the same for the other plants. Polystichum mutinum, or sword fern, is not a good indicator for moisture because it can grow in a wide range of conditions, so it's blank in the appendix, but it's a member of indicator species group 3 for nutrients. So when we enter that, it's really important that even though it wasn't an indicator for moisture, to put a little dash or an X or something there so it's clear, if we need to look back at the form, that we looked it up and it wasn't an indicator, rather than we just forgot to enter it. It is an indicator for nutrient, however. It's an indicator species group 3. Once we've entered all these values, we'll sum up the moisture percent cover and sum up the nutrient percent cover. Note that it's unlikely to add up to exactly 100%, and it could be less or more. Part of that is we're estimating the percent cover, so there may be some imprecision in our estimates. And also, since there are potentially a few different layers of vegetation there, we could have nearly 100% cover of moss right at the ground level, for example, but still have herbs and shrubs growing over it. So we could still have over 100% cover the way we're tallying it up. And we do the same for nutrients. In this case, the nutrients total up to 127.2. For the next step, we need to divide up those percent covers that we wrote down by the indicator species group. So in the table on the right, I've entered all of the percent cover values based on which species group they were in. So for group 3, for example, we only had one entry and it was 1, so I put that there. For group 4, we had quite a few, so 7.2, 30, and so on. Now here's where that total comes in. So we enter, all, enter them all in, add up each of those columns, but then divide it by that total, 95.8. So that's going to normalize the values. So now we have these values that are going to sum to 100. So we've accounted for the fact that we didn't initially have values that summed to 100. And once we've totaled this up, we're going to compare this to a standard table of actual soil moisture regimes based on indicator species group plant frequency from the field guide. And we're going to try to figure out which of those rows most closely matches what we found in the field. In our case, about 73% of our frequency was for group 4. So if we look down, moist is the one that has the most for group 4. We're pretty close to that. We didn't have quite as much frequency in group 3, but about the same in group 5 compared to moist. So it seems pretty clear that moist is where we line up here. So we have an actual SMR of moist based on the indicator plants. As I mentioned earlier, this relationship between the actual and relative SMR depends on the biogeoclimatic unit. So in this case, we figured that our actual SMR is moist, or M, and here for this biogeoclimatic unit, an actual soil moisture regime of moist corresponds to a relative soil moisture re regime of 5, or subhygric. The procedure for SMR is a little bit different. It starts out the same. We're still going to tally up all of those percent covers by indicator species group, as we've done on the right there. 
and we're going to add them up and then divide by that initial total so that now we've normalized them. So when we tally them up again, they sum to 100. The difference is that rather than matching up to a table, we're just going to look at the frequency percent for category three, the plants that have our indicators of rich sites. In our case, our frequency total for indicator species group three was 43.6. So if we look at the table, that falls into the rich and very rich category. So we're in rich or very rich D or E. We go back to our edotopic grid. We already figured out our SMR, and now we think we're in the rich or very rich range for our soil nutrient regime. So that's gonna put us in the site association seven or the site series CWHVM107.